In 1987, two young women were brutally beaten and strangled, but the horror didn't end with their death. Their killer took pleasure in assaulting their corpses, and then he seemed to vanish. For 33 years, their unsolved deaths were known around Great Britain as the bedsit murders, but what no one knew was that their killer had evolved into something more twisted. He became a necrophiliac monster, haunting the morgues and defiling corpses. And what he did to them will take your breath away. I'm Amy, and you found True Crime Recaps. Now, the last day of 25-year-old Wendy Nell's life was uneventful until it wasn't. June 23rd, 1987, found her working her regular shift at Super Snaps, a photo development center she managed in Tunbridge Wells, England. When the clock struck five, she collected her things and stopped at the bank before going home. Later that evening, she went to her boyfriend's house to spend time with him and his mother. By 11, he was dropping her off at home. When she unlocked the door to her cozy little bedsit, she had sleep on her mind, but she walked into a nightmare. The next day, when Wendy didn't show up for work, her boyfriend went to her place to check on her. He found her in her bloody bed, naked, covered by a duvet. She was beaten and strangled, and horrifyingly, after she was dead, this monster raped her corpse. Shockingly, none of her neighbors heard a thing through the thin walls. Five months later, not far away, 20-year-old Caroline Pierce took a taxi home around midnight after a fun night out with friends. But instead of unwinding before bed, neighbors reported hearing a high-pitched scream coming from her place that night. But when help arrived, she was nowhere to be found. For three weeks, there was no sign of her. And then one day, 40 miles away, a farmer spotted something strange from behind the wheel of his tractor. A battered woman wearing only her tights was lying in a watery ditch. The mystery of what happened to Caroline had finally been solved. Just like Wendy, she was beaten and strangled and her corpse was assaulted. The only clues their killer left behind were a bloody fingerprint on a shopping bag and a bloody footprint on the sleeve of Wendy's white shirt. Oh, and his semen on Caroline's thigh. But back then they couldn't do much with the DNA and the other leads came up empty. So over time, the cases went cold and the two unsolved crimes became known as the bedsit murders. For decades, there was no justice, no name to lay the blame on, no explanation for any of it. Why them? Why desecrate their bodies? And the biggest question of all, Were there more victims out there? As the years went by and DNA technology evolved, the local police decided to take another crack at the bedsit murders by using familial DNA testing. Now, those three words should strike fear into the hearts of killers everywhere. Because now, police can test unknown DNA against DNA submitted to some ancestry sites. And if anyone in their family, even people they're only distantly related to, has ever been curious about their genealogy, well, they can expect a knock on the door. And for the bedsit murderer, that knock came in December 2020. 33 years after he brutally ended Caroline and Wendy's lives. When I think about the kind of person that could do those things to a human being, I can't help but picture a a dark, filthy hovel, this gruesome man, unloved, hated by his neighbors, angry, mean. Yeah, if only, because then everyone would know to stay clear of people like that. And we all know that the truth is much more terrifying. The worst predators disguise themselves so they look just like anyone else. And that is what David Fuller was good at. When the cops traced his DNA to his doorstep, the man who opened it could have been their grandfather. He was a 67-year-old, mild-mannered father of four, living in a lovely neighborhood in East Sussex. After spending a little time in the Navy, he had built a career as an electrician, sort of a maintenance man, at two respected hospitals in Kent and Sussex. His co-workers liked him. They told the BBC he was the kind of guy who would change a light bulb or fix a fuse with a smile. 
He was also kind of a hoarder, not the type you might see on a reality show, but the kind of guy who saved every piece of electronics and paperwork he ever used over the years. They found something like 30 cell phones, old ones that didn't even work. He had dozens of computers and laptops. He saved receipts going back to the early 80s. He kept his calendars and appointment books. So why Wendy? Why Caroline? What connection did he have to them? Well, as they sorted through 250 boxes full of stuff, they got their answer. Over the years, he'd taken hundreds, maybe thousands of pictures of this and that. And in one picture taken in 1989, he's lying on his stomach in the grass, enjoying a picnic, and the soles of his sneakers are showing. The same sneakers that stepped in Wendy's blood and left its mark on her white sleeve two years before. They also found dozens of receipts from Supa Snaps where Wendy worked. That was the link between them. He chose her because he was a regular at her store. They also found receipts from a restaurant called Buster Browse. He seemed to really like the food there. Unfortunately, that's where he developed an obsession with Caroline. She was a popular waitress there. She probably served him his fish and chips with a smile and a friendly greeting, never knowing she was looking at the man who would take her life. He was just so ordinary. No one would have believed he was so evil. Not his three wives, not his four children, not even his neighbors had anything bad to say about him, other than that he was more quiet than normal, and he kept the blinds drawn more often than the rest of the houses on his street, but otherwise... Oh, they do remember him washing his car a lot. It seemed like a strange quirk back then until they saw him taken away in handcuffs. And in hindsight, they remember hearing him driving away at odd hours, like at two or three in the morning. And when you hear where he was going, well, you won't forget this story in a hurry. Let's just say the police had no idea what kind of a monster they had in custody. Hidden in a secret compartment behind a closet cabinet in his home office were four hard drives packed with millions of depraved images and videos of him abusing hundreds of dead women in the morgue of a local hospital. It made no difference how young or old they were. He assaulted women of all ages. At least three of them were children and the youngest was only nine. His oldest victim was 100, and not only did he record himself abusing their corpses, but he organized the pictures and videos according to what he did to them. He labeled one folder, best yet, and he even went back to some of the same victims to abuse them multiple times. As horrifying as that is, it gets worse. He wrote their names and ages in a little black book. And then he looked them up on Facebook so he could see pictures of them alive. He got a thrill out of reading their friends and family's grieving posts, knowing the kind of control he had over them after death. Along with his twisted memorabilia, they found an electrical stimulation machine. Now, normally that's used for pain relief, but considering how depraved he was, there is no telling what he might have been doing with it. Can you imagine their families, their loved ones already going through the pain of losing someone important to them. And now to know that the people they love were treated in that kind of a way after their deaths, uh, it's beyond words. I mean, how does something this awful even happen? As it turns out, it wasn't difficult for him to do. His job on the maintenance team came with an all-access swipe card. The neighbors heard him leaving home at odd hours because he volunteered for the late shifts, so he had easy access to the morgue at night when the place was quiet, and he knew how to get away with it. According to the BBC, one end of the room can be seen on security cameras, but the other end, where the post-mortem exams happen, doesn't have any cameras. And that is where he did his sick photo shoots. He carried on like that for 12 years, right up until the day they caught him. And it happened at two different hospitals. He wasn't caught on CCTV once. And no one thought to wonder why a maintenance man had to spend so much time in the morgue. The thing was, he got the job just so he could have access to the bodies. Caroline and Wendy were killed so he could use them after death. 
It's no words. It makes you wonder what were the red flags? What was this guy like as a kid? Well, there's not a lot of information about his childhood. According to the standard, he used to set fires and steal bikes. In the early 70s, he graduated to breaking into houses. He got caught for that, but he didn't do any jail time. The reason for that decision isn't very well explained. Maybe because he didn't steal enough to qualify as like grand larceny. Maybe he just wanted to look at people's things. Maybe he just wanted to like feel that power. Around the same time, though, police were getting a lot of reports about a creeper sneaking around, looking in people's windows. So, you know, he was always a weirdo. But how did he graduate to necrophilia? So I checked it out on Psychology Today. And according to them, not even the experts know for sure how and why this disorder happens. Honestly, the way I was reading it, it's super disturbing, like to everyone, doctors, laymen, all of us, we're all super disturbed by this. Some experts think they do it because they want a partner that won't resist, someone that won't judge them or pressure them. It's the same reason some people prefer sex dolls, but obviously like way, way more twisted. And based on his interview with the police, not even David knows why he did it, or if he does... He's not saying. At first, he just lied and he denied the murders, the rapes, the desecration, everything. And then he tried a diminished capacity defense, otherwise basically known as the insanity defense. But halfway through his trial, he gave it up and took the guilty verdict. Throughout the whole thing, the interrogation, the trial, he refused to talk about his reasons for it. And he seemed uncomfortable about being questioned about it, which honestly... Is probably the most genuinely normal feeling he's ever had. Now, I got to say, this is the kind of case that's going to stick with me for a while. I don't know about you, but it's definitely going to stick with me. It is the worst case of necrophilia in British history, maybe in the entire world. There really isn't anything that could heal the hurt he caused those families. The tremendous pain and suffering they've had to go through is unfathomable. But it's nice to know he got two life sentences and he's never getting out. So, if you ever wonder if monsters exist, remember David Fuller, and you know that they do. I, for one, am thankful that he's behind bars, but what do you think of his crimes? How would you feel if you found out your dearly departed loved one was a victim of something like that? Let's vent about it in the comments below, because... I have some thoughts. Meanwhile, if you like getting all the crime in half the time, it would mean a lot if you subscribed and hit the bell so you never miss a story. 